Gotcha. All right. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I'm going to go ahead and get going on time here. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming out to the early session here. Uh, so the topic of the talk, as you can see from the title, is navigation in Windows Store apps. Uh, this is a uh, kind of fundamentals introductory level course here. So I like to survey the crowd here and just get a sense of what backgrounds people are coming from. First off, is there anyone here other than Christian I know uh, that has a, an app in the Windows Store already? A couple of you. Okay, so some of this may be, you know, kind of fundamental level stuff, but at a minimum, hopefully it will reinforce some of the, uh, the application lifecycle and some of the subtleties that you may not have encountered or even realized in building out those applications for building future ones that may be more complex. All right, so uh, a little background on myself. I'm from a company called Soliance. We do end-to-end -end, uh, software development projects. We do architecture consulting, training, that kind of thing. I'm also a Microsoft Regional Director. Uh, that's a program. There's about 130 of us worldwide. We work directly with the product teams and senior leadership at Microsoft to give them feedback and also help evangelize products. Um, it's somewhat similar to the MVP program, just different numbers there. Also a, a Microsoft MVP in the dying silver life category. Uh, and also a Pluralsight author. Um, got a number of courses in the library already. Uh, two somewhat relevant here is I've got one on kind of the fundamentals of doing MVVM, the model view view model pattern, in uh, Windows Store apps. And then I've got one that just released about a week and a half ago on using the Prism for Windows runtime guidance that I gave a talk on yesterday uh, for Windows Store apps. Also, just so I know uh, what kind of shared audience, how many of you were at my Prism for Windows runtime talk yesterday? OK, a few of you. All right. And let's see here, a few other questions. How many of you have WPF or Silverlight background? Most of you, OK. Um, any web developers? OK. And let's see, anything else relevant? Uh, if I think of it, I'll ask it at the time. All right, so uh, the other important stuff here, I guess, is my contact information there at the bottom right. We've got a nice small crowd here. Uh, if you do have questions, feel free to interrupt me and ask those. Uh, I'll try to remember to repeat them back, but if you're close to a microphone and want to go to the mic so it gets on the recording, that would be good as well. But do feel free to contact me offline through any of those means up there. Uh, the demos I'm going to do, I'm going to do a few of them kind of on the fly. I will zip those up uh, after the fact and put them on my blog uh, so you can get to those later today. All right, so what I'm going to go through here is first I'm going to talk about just kind of the basic navigation schemes in a Windows Store application, the different styles of navigation, and what some of the fundamental APIs are of the way you accomplish navigation. Then we're also going to talk about the application lifecycle, and that's really an important aspect of building out a Windows Store app, and it's very different from either smart client type technologies like Windows Forms or WPF or Silverlight versus uh, web applications. You know, it's, it's not like either one of those, uh, because there's this lifecycle where you can get suspended, terminated, and resumed, and there are certain design guidelines that you're supposed to follow when doing that. So we'll talk about what some of those are and show you how it manifests itself in the code. The first half of the talk here, I'm going to be sticking to just kind of straight Windows Store app programming, meaning putting all the code and the code behind of the pages. Um, but towards the end of the talk, I also want to talk about, that was the other question, how many people in here have had exposure to or have done the model view view model pattern? Okay, good number of you. So towards the end of the talk, what I'm going to show you is, you know, how does that look different? So for, for the people who were in my uh, PRISM talk yesterday, what I'm really going to be showing here is how PRISM can help you do manage this navigation stuff in the context of an MVVM app. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about the navigation mechanisms there. There might be a little repeat for those that were in the talk yesterday, um, but I'll kind of just focus on the navigational aspects of doing that in an MVVM app. So when it comes to Windows Store apps and the modern UI style guidelines, there's specific navigational schemes that they talk about in those guidelines. The most common, and in fact, you know, one of the things I'm also going to show here is just demo a few apps to talk through and make sure everyone can visualize uh, these different schemes. But the most common by far is a hierarchical navigation scheme. The idea is when you first launch the app, you land on some sort of home or hub page that is top-level summary information for whatever that application is all about. And then you can drill down from there, usually on that hub page, there are navigational links, often big fat square tiles, uh, using grid view kind of layout that you can click on to drill down to some level of information. And it might be, if it's a very simple app, it may be one level deep. 
and you just go directly to details for, say, uh, um, t Twitter feed. You know, it may be a very simple Twitter app that the top level hub page just shows the summary of all the latest tweets, and you click down to an individual tweet and it's got its own view. Um, but for more complicated apps, especially it's really based on what the data model of your application is often, it's how you want to surface that data model, and that data model itself is often hierarchical. <clears throat> so you'll have a, often a level, <clears throat> can't lose my voice already, a level or several levels down that you can drill down to, and each of those is still kind of a summary over you know, some grouping of data and some rendering of that. And then eventually you end up down at what would be called a detail page, where it's just focused on one thing. So normally if you're going to have kind of direct interaction with the user, uh, any kind of input or things like that, that's going to be more down at a detail page level. The other uh, primary form of navigation they talk about in the style guidelines is a, a flat navigation. And this would be a scheme where you don't really have an information hierarchy like I was talking about for the hierarchical. You just have some sort of top level construct and then the user interacts with that construct. Now the primary app that, that has this, uh, if you have played with the IE10 browser in the from the start screen, you know, basically we get away from the tab metaphor that most browsers have had up till now, or at least in recent years, uh, where you can have multiple sites open at the same time and just switch between them through tabs. And we get into this idea that you have whole separate pages for each of the open sessions for different sites that you're interacting with. Each of those is treated as a peer from the navigational scheme, so there's ways to switch between them, but there's no inherent hierarchy between them. You know, all the content of the page itself obviously could have dense content, and you can navigate within that page if it's a single page application itself, and you go to something like Gmail there, you know, you could be switching views within it and so on. It's got its own navigational scheme as a page and as a website, um, but that's sort of out of the scope of the app that's providing it, which is Internet Explorer. And you can see the same thing if they were to port Word over to being a Windows Store application. You could have multiple documents open at one time. The structure of the document you know, is kind of inherent, but it's out of the navigation scheme of the app itself. Now, you can mix these two. So <clears throat> some apps you'll see that once you get down to a detail level, for example, if you've arrived there by navigating down through, say, some grouping, then you may have forward and back navigation between all of the detail pages at a given level in the hierarchy, and I'll show that in one of the demos as well. In terms of controlling navigation, it's important to understand the, the role of app bars in Windows Store applications. So here I'm showing the weather app, and I'll, I'll demo this live here in a moment to show a few examples. But app bars show up at the top and bottom. First off, let me also uh, ask one other question here. How many people here have not even played with applications from the Windows Store? I would think by now, with all the surfaces and stuff, you've at least tinkered around. So you've probably seen these. Uh, you get the app bars to show up in, in a Windows Store app one of several ways. One is if you right-click anywhere in an open area of the app with a mouse. Uh, another is on a touch-based device. If you do a swiping gesture from top or bottom, it makes those pop out. Uh, and if you're a keyboard person, the, you know, it's good to start learning some of these keystrokes that make these hidden gestures and stuff work, especially if you're on a non-touch device. Or if you're like, I was at a demo station the other day down on the floor. They have these nice big giant touch monitors with like a one inch bevel on the edge of the screen. It's really hard to get that one pixel on the edge of the screen when there's a one inch indentation there. So luckily I knew the keystrokes to bring stuff up. But it's, uh, commit, the Windows key Z will bring out your app bars if, you, if you're a uh, command stroke kind of guy. So top and bottom app bars, there is a division of responsibility here in terms of what should go in, in which app bar. The app bar at the bottom is supposed to be more like your toolbar in traditional desktop applications. It's supposed to be commands relevant to what you currently see on the screen or what you currently have selected on the screen. So it definitely can be dynamic. You can hide and show different commands and icons down there. Um, they're really, you know, even though they tend to be rendered like this and look kind of icon-like, they're really just buttons uh, in the toolbar is what you typically have there. But they're supposed to be context sensitive, basically, of whatever's currently on the screen or currently selected on the screen. Um, the top nav bar is primarily supposed to be about navigation. So that's where you're going to have these navigational links. And you see you got home play places. And this is actually an old screenshot. They updated the weather app recently. And there's more stuff there, as you'll see in a moment. Um, 
So these, this is where you're going to put those sort of top level places. If you think about, you know, if you were going to rewrite Outlook as a Windows Store app and put everything in one app, which would actually kind of go against the modern design guidelines. That's why they have a separate mail app and a separate calendar app. Each app is supposed to be about kind of one focused thing. Um, but if you conceptually were to create Outlook again as a single store app, then you could imagine up at the top you would have inbox, calendar, tasks, and so on as major navigation links within your application. All right, so let's switch over here and look at a few examples. Is that the right one? I believe so, yeah. Got to unlock here. Okay, so what I want to do is just go to the start screen and just talk through a few examples um, just to emphasize some of these navigation schemes. So showing that weather app running here, you know, one of the first uh, sort of navigational layout metaphors to get used to is the idea that you can have these wide, wide scrolling views. And the preference is for horizontal scrolling instead of vertical scrolling, which is kind of different than traditional desktop apps. Um, so in the weather app, you can see, you know, you have some landing place that's summary top level information about your current weather. And that's where I live is Alexandria. Um, looks like I'm glad I'm not home. Um, and then you've got other types of information that can break out from there. As I mentioned, if I right click or uh, window key Z, we'll pop out these app bars. And you can see now there's a few other choices in the updated weather app here. If I go to something like world weather, I get a full page navigation there. And so under, under the scheme here, there's a frame that contains all these pages. It's tracking what pages you've navigated through. Uh, that page can do whatever it wants in terms of rendering, but notice the back button in the upper left corner. So it knows that I was on page one, I went to page two, so there is a back navigation path like a browser to get back there. Luckily, it doesn't have quite as many negative con uh, connotations as the back button in the browser for web developers. Now, in the weather app, they show a couple other things here, is that if I drill down to something like maps, notice at the top they have a app bar looky, look, uh, an app bar sort of thingy whenever I'm moving the mouse around, but if I stop moving it for a moment, kind of disappears and lets me focus on the content. Now that's not actually, I, I haven't, you know, I don't, I don't know what code they use for this, but if you have that thing up and you right click, you see that that's not actually the primary app bar. The primary app bars are still there if I right click or Windows Z. So they're rendering that as part of the page, but they're following the same kind of visual metaphor. This is a way to navigate. Um, and so what it represents there is that no, notice that it's switching different kinds of views on this. So you could think of this as like a list view, detail view, icon view of some data that you were going to render that they've chose to put up here at the top. Now the reason, you know, these are good apps to look at is these are being produced by Microsoft and they're heavily reviewed. They have a, a first party app review process that they go through. Any app produced by Microsoft for the Windows Store goes through an extra scrutiny process because they want to make sure it's really following you know, what the people who own the modern UI design style guidelines, they want to make sure it's not contradictory to those in any way. So these are actually decent apps to look at for ideas to say, you know, if I do it the way that's doing it, then I know I'm pr probably following the, the modern UI style guidelines pretty well. But, you know, as a contrast though, because these are really just making alterations of the current view, you will see a number of apps out there that put that kind of stuff into the bottom app bar. So, for example, you know, switching between icon view and detail view, you could view that as an interaction with the current content of the view, and it's perfectly legal to put that down in the bottom app bar. But this one, because it's sort of a navigation to the user, they follow a similar metaphor and put it up top. But in terms of the page-based navigation that we'll be looking at in the code, you know, this whole thing is just one page in the stack, and back navigation takes us out to where we were. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so, you know, when there, when there is back navigation, the button should show. In fact, they make this easy, as I'll show in the code. They've got a style that's in the common styles that's applied, that if you just disable the button, it also makes it invisible. Okay, one other thing to show here while I'm in this app is that just uh, relevant to that navigation stack is if we go to the home page directly, you can see there's no back button up here because now we're back to the root uh, and so on. But if we get there through back navigation, so I can go and say, let's see if I can remember the right sequence here. If I go uh, world weather and then I go home and then I go ski resorts, let's say, 
Now if I start back navigating, notice I'm on the home page, but I do have a back button because there was a sequence of navigational steps that I took to get there that included kind of going back to the home, but then back off somewhere else. So it does maintain that entire navigation stack of you know, where did you go and how did you get there. All right, so that's you know, one of the primary apps. And, and you can see there is a little bit of a hierarchy there in that you can drill down to, for example, the maps view and, and come back up. Uh, but a you know, more typical hierarchical navigation scheme one would be something like the news app. If I can find which one that is here. If the connectivity is decent here, you know, they've got categories, so you can drill down to top stories, and then you're still going to have a collection of items that are top stories or world news or so on. So that's that kind of section view or grouping, and then you eventually drill down to some individual item that has its details, and it remembers that full navigation path. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, so the question is, when, when you go back to the home page, as in the start page? Yeah, the start yeah, when you go back to the start page, does it shut down the app entirely? I'm going to get to that shortly. So I'll, I'll hold that question when I talk about the application lifecycle. Okay, um, and then certainly, you know, if you're a game like Angry Birds or something like that, you're not going to follow any of these modern style guidelines. You know, you have control, complete control of the palette. You're going to do whatever makes sense for whatever your game is. And certainly that could apply to other apps too. So don't feel constrained that you have to be, you know, 100% big fat square tiles and hierarchical navigation and back buttons exactly like you see in all these things. Uh, in fact, there was a, a blog post I saw recently talking to one of the original designers who was involved in coming up with this modern UI style. And he said that uh, you know, one of the biggest problems he sees right now is that every single Windows Store app looks exactly the same, and it kind of makes them all feel boring. And, and you know, he was basically saying it was never the intent that every app should look the same. It was just that it's a starting point to deviate from. So you know, there are certain things you have to comply with, uh, or you could get rejected from the store. And there's some decent posts out there that summarize some of those things. But you know, ultimately, you've got free range. You've got a full screen palette here to put whatever you want on the screen, whatever kind of navigational links you want. So that, you know, there are some, like Netflix here, that deviate somewhat uh, from the navigation schemes. They're still mostly you know, square tiles and stuff. But you can see they've eschewed the app bars. I'm right clicking here, and there's no app bars at all in this app. They do all their navigation through this uh, you know, thing over here. And then you can drill down to individual items but there's no app bars anywhere. Everything is done interactively within whatever view you're in. They do at least have the back navigation, and that looks consistent. Uh, but the idea is you can you know, deviate from this. Don't feel like you have to be big square tiles and app bars and that kind of thing if it doesn't make sense for your app. OK, so let me switch back for a moment and talk about the underlying classes that we're going to be working with here. Uh, and I'll get to your question on the application lifecycle as well. So the primary classes, as I mentioned, that you're going to work with is the frame class. The frame class is basically a content control. If you've been exposed to other XAML technologies, it really just inherits from content control, which means it can have one child UI element that is what it's presenting inside itself. So your root frame really takes over that full screen or snap view or filled view <clears throat> when your app gets dragged around. And that is worth just kind of mentioning as a side note here that um, when you build out these apps, you need to always accommodate SnapView. In fact, uh, I talked to one guy who said that the way he approaches things is he designs for SnapView first, and then he kind of expands and figures out how to render things in full view and filled view from there, which is kind of similar to a design philosophy if you've heard of mobile first for web application development. It's the idea of designing for the more constrained form factor, such as a phone, and then figuring out now that you have the luxury of more real estate if you're on a desktop, for example, then you can figure out how you want to morph things and lay it out from there. So you could take that same approach. That, you know, always keep in mind that your app needs to accommodate going into SnapView. Uh, there are a number of apps out there. If you go pull some of these down from the store, they basically punt, and they show an icon when you go into SnapView. And the app is completely unusable in SnapView. It's legal. You can put it in the store that way, but it's not a good way to please your users. So you really should be designing you know, a, a decent interaction with the page. Now, you may trim it down and say, OK, I'm only going to show them a third of what they could normally do with a full screen page. But give them something to work with when they're in SnapView. 
Um, so this frame is going to be the root. It's going to contain your pages, whether you're in snap build or full view. Uh, and it does it really under the covers by setting its content to the current page. It also is your primary point of interaction programmatically for causing navigation to occur. So it exposes navigation APIs, a navigate, go back, go forward, can go back, can go forward. Um, we'll see some of these in the demo. And then there's also events associated with when navigation happens that you can tap into through the frame class. It's also the thing that's tracking, you know, which pages has it swapped out. So it's got a navigation stack that it can use to manage these go back, go forward type commands. Then there's the pages. That's really where you're going to spend your time. The frame is just infrastructure that's there in the Windows Store app for you to benefit from. Pages where you're going to spend your time as a base class. It's your top level UIs. You're going to design your content within those. Um, it is uh, one key thing to understand about these is the frame class and the page class. Those are unmanaged WinRT classes. You know, those are down in the operating system themselves. So sometimes when things go wrong, and I'll show one example in the demos, you're going to get com errors and you know, these weird things that make you feel like you're stepping back a, a decade in development because you're really working with unmanaged objects even from your managed code in C Sharp uh, and, and VB. So the page gets called from the operating system from the WinRT APIs when it gets navigated to. So it has an opportunity to participate as it's being navigated to and from. It also has a property for the frame class so that you can get to those exposed APIs for controlling navigation and participating in it. And then the application is also uh, relevant here because ultimately there's, you know, at, at a minimum, there's one navigation that happens as your app starts up to load up the first page. So it's going to command the first navigation. And then there's also other forms of activation of your app that you may choose to do other kinds of, of, of navigation based on that activation. And I'll show that in the demos. So you've got your kind of initial nav to your first page. There's also tying in, there's a lot of overlap here between just pure navigation and the application lifecycle stuff that I'll talk more about here in just a moment. Uh, how many people in here are XAML developers primarily in terms of Windows Store apps? Any WinJS developers? I may be there. So I'm going to quickly, you know, just compare and contrast just for awareness here. You know, what if you pick that HTML JavaScript way of building your Windows Store app? Are things just like radically different or is it just really a different syntax on building the same kind of app? When it comes to navigation, it's really just a different syntax. So you still have a kind of root thing that you deal with instead of a frame. It's a namespace in JavaScript that's the WinJS navigation namespace. That exposes APIs to cause navigation to occur. Um, it's got events that can fire that you can tap into to know when navigation's happening, and it's the thing that's tracking the navigation stack. So you can see the direct parallel here that it's kind of the, the moral equivalent to the frame class in XAML technologies. For uh, being part of the navigation, you've got a, a WinJS UI pages thing that has a define method, and it's got various options that you can hook up in the define method. Specifically, a ready handler is kind of the thing that you would wire up that's like an unnavigated to in the XAML world where you can say, okay, I've just been activated. What do I want to initialize within my page? And then at the application level, there is an application uh, namespace where you get everything initialized. That's where you do your initial navigation, uh, similar to the app class in XAML, and an activated event uh, that you handle things. The one thing that is different in uh, the WinJS world is they actually give a little bit more templating around this. They've got a class called a page uh, or a function, a JavaScript object, really, that's called the page control navigator. And it's just got a, it's kind of got the encapsulation around those same uh, types of navigation functions that the frame class would have. So this is, you know, somewhat more the moral equivalent for the frame class, but it's pre-generated by Visual Studio into your WinJS projects if you pick the right project type. And I'll show that in the demos here. So it just uh, wraps all the navigation management of making calls. Now, getting to the application lifecycle part, this is, like I said, this is the thing you really want to wrap your head around because it's very different from desktop technologies and web application technologies. Your app goes through a number of different states. It's really just a state machine we're talking about here, but it goes through some uh, different states. At start of life, once you've installed it on the machine, or you also end up in this state if you've restarted the box, your app is not running. Then the user launches it, clicks on a live tile on the start screen, the app comes up full screen initially and starts running and could be put in snapped or filled view. 
at some point, the user is going to get distracted. They're going to switch off to another app. They want to check their email, check their Twitter feed, whatever. So they, you know, the keystrokes for this is your Windows key tab instead of alt tab. Windows key tab will sequence between your Windows Store apps. And so they could Windows key tab. They could do the swipey gesture from the left side of the screen on a touch base device. Um, they could just hit the start button and go back to the start screen. So getting back to your question, any uh, departing from your current full screen app, if it's not on screen is the way to think about it, whether it's snap view, filled view, or full view, if it's not on screen, then it's going to go into this suspended state. There's a slight delay there, about uh, three to five seconds, depending on what your app does. Uh, there's a, really a five second maximum there that if you don't successfully complete doing what you're supposed to do uh, within five seconds, you're going to be terminated. And I'll talk more about terminated here in a minute. So you don't want to do any heavy lifting here, make some big, long blocking you know, service calls, serializing the state of the world uh, when you get suspended. And, and it does factor into the way you design your apps is that you really want to, as you go from page to page in your app, you want to progressively save your state. Don't just buffer it all in memory and think that you're going to have time to do some Mondo save call at the point where you get suspended. You need to be you know, progressively saving your state all along the way so that when that suspension happens, that can be fast, your, your handling of that can be fast so that you don't get terminated for misbehaving. When you get suspended, your app is sort of in suspended animation, okay? It's memory is intact, so you've still got your stack and your heap, all the memory, your object graphs that you've built up, whatever page is currently on screen, all of its controls, all the state of those controls, the text that the user has typed into a text box, what's selected in a list view, all of that stuff is still just sitting there in memory because really those are all just properties on some object in memory. But all of the threads of execution get taken away from the app. So if you go to Task Manager, you'll see the CPU time goes to, to 0% and it stays there. And so your app has no opportunity to do anything when you're in a suspended state. Now there are some background APIs. There's a separate talk. Um, I'm not sure, does anyone know, has Tony Champion given his background APIs talk or is that later today? I believe there's a talk later today on background APIs that tell you some of the things you could do in the background uh, from a Windows Store app, but it's not like a desktop app where you can just say, eh, they can just minimize me and I'll party on with 10 worker threads and still be getting stuff done. Windows Store app, you can't do that. Um, so once you're suspended, there's no execution. There is a suspended event that fires in your app at an application class level, and that's your opportunity to do some handling of the fact that you're being suspended and do that kind of final save there. Now from there, you know, while all those objects are still in memory, they go quickly check their email, check their Twitter feed, and then they come back to your application. Everything's still in memory at that point. So all that really happens when you resume from suspension is you start getting threads again. So it basically figures out, you know, where was the execution pointer for whatever the current thread was, the UI thread primarily, and it's just going to allocate a thread, put the execution pointer back in whatever method, probably down in the message loop somewhere. Uh, that, that it was at, and it's just going to start running again. Um, so, you know, you could be in the middle of doing some loop in your code when you get suspended, and it's going to remember that it's on iteration 52, and when it comes back from suspension, it's going to be on 53, 54, and keep going from there. Now, from that point, the user can certainly choose to close the application. And if you played with any of the early betas, this is one of those things that it's like, it's a good thing Microsoft actually listens to feedback. Because when the early betas first came up, there was no way to close a Windows Store application. They ran forever from a, from a user's perspective. Um, and a lot of people said, you know, that's not really a good idea. So they followed the feedback and said, okay, basically Alt F4 or, uh, I'm just kind of unlocking my screen as I talk here, Alt F4 or a swipey gesture, if you don't know this one, if you swipe from the top of the screen to the bottom of the screen on a touch-based device, that is a gesture that says close this application. So it goes into a fully closed state. Uh, there's a flag that is set that it is closed by user. And then if they start the application again, it's actually on your launching of the application, you'll get a flag I'll show in the demos that tells you that the last running state of this application was closed by user. So that gives you some indication and it allows you to basically choose that when you launch from closed by user versus when you launch from not running, you might actually present a different user experience. Now, the general guidelines are those should be the same. You know, that's a fresh start from the user's perspective. If they explicitly close the app, then it's kind of like a fresh start from not running in terms of what you should present them. 
but because there is that flag there to differentiate, there may be some pieces of state you want to retain and you know, kind of represent to the user the last thing they were doing or you know, some historical tasks that they worked on last or something like that. You could drive that based off the closed by user possibly. The one where things get complicated is the terminated state. So once you go into suspension, you're sitting there, everything's still in memory, all the threads have been taken away from you. If the system's running low on memory, and this would typically happen if the user launches their email, launches Twitter, launches Angry Birds, launches news, launches this, you know, and they just forget all about your app. They've gone away, really. Um, but they may still come back to your app, and if they were in the middle of doing something in your app, they think of all these as just kind of running in the background from a user perspective. So if you get terminated, the modern UI design guidelines say that the end user experience should be that when they come back to your app, it should be exactly the same as if they just came back from suspension. And that's where it gets hard, because when you get terminated, all your memory just gets wiped. And nothing happens in your app, no events fire, no execution happens, you have no opportunity to react to termination specifically. And you can see from the graph there that from suspended, there's three different paths you can go. You can go activated right away. When you, I should have mentioned, when you go directly from suspended to running again, nothing happens there either. So there's no event that fires, there's nothing, just stuff starts happening again in your application because you've got a threat again. So, and closed by user, you know, you've, you've shut down in a different way there. So basically it means that every time your app gets suspended, you have to assume the worst and assume that you might be terminated from that suspension state. And that's why I say you have to be proactively saving your state, and you also have to have mechanisms in your app to restore that state if the way you got shut down was through termination. Because of the modern guidelines, the idea is that the end user, you know, they swipe away, they open all these things, and they alt tab and your app's not there anymore because it got terminated. They go click on the live tile. It should come back up wherever they were in the app with whatever they were doing in the app. So it should be transparent to them that the app was terminated. They shouldn't even know that that, that concept really exists for your average end user. So when you launch again, basically you have to have code that restores all the transient state. And what we're really talking about here, I want to emphasize this because there were some questions after my talk yesterday about this talking about transient state here. Now certainly throughout the life cycle of your application, there's lots of things the user's gonna do interacting with your application that you may be making service calls and storing things, persisting things on the back end that have to do with their interaction. That's kinda outside the scope of the state I'm talking about right now. What I'm talking about is transient things, things held in memory and objects that are gonna get wiped clean when that app gets terminated. So that includes a lot of subtle things, you know, obvious things are, They've typed something into a text box. That's just stuff in the text property of that text box. You wipe the memory clean, that goes away because you haven't pressed the save button, for example. Or maybe you save when you tab off the field, depending on your, your choices there. So you know, once you've made an act, active call to persist something, it's kind of out of the realm of worrying about getting terminated or not. And it's up to your code to make sure it's restored appropriately from wherever that persisted location was. But the transient state things are things like, what page am I on? What was the navigation history of the stack that got me here? You know, what is any transient input from the user in the form of text in the text box, selections in a list box, scroll position in a page? Those are all forms of transient input that you should restore when you come back from termination. If you come back from suspension, it just happens automatically because it's all just still stuff in memory. But if you come back from termination, everything's been wiped clean, you have to have written that out in some way so that you can read it back in. And we'll see how to do that in code here. So the classes that uh, support you on doing this stuff are actually injected by Visual Studio. It's a little weird because it's not built into the framework itself. These are classes that when you say file new project, code gen happens into your Visual Studio project to give you some base classes to help out with some of this stuff. So there's layout aware page is a base class for your pages. It's got some methods in it for loading and saving state relevant to this application lifecycle and navigation. So basically load is gonna be called anytime you directly navigate to a page. It's also gonna be called when you resume from termination so that you have an opportunity to load back in that persisted state. And then save conversely is called anytime you leave a page so that you can proactively save state each time you navigate like I talked about. But it's also there so that you can save on suspension so that when you come back from termination and the load gets called, you can read that data back in. 
Um, it derives from page, which is the primary class. And as I talked about before, that gives you access to the frame class to cause navigation and have more direct uh, interaction with it. Um, the other thing that's, you know, the name is a little misleading here of layout aware page. Um, it's not really, if you go look at all the code in layout aware page, it doesn't really know anything about your layout. What it's really aware of is visual state changes. So what it's got is some helper code. If you're familiar with the visual state manager, it was in Silverlight and, and WPF got it later as well. It's the way that you control kind of morphing your view, especially for things like transition to snap view, filled view, and, and full view. Um, that's how you decide how to rearrange things, resize them, hide things, and so on, is primarily through visual state changes. So really what the layout aware page extra code, other than the state management stuff, does is it gives you a, uh, a handler that says whenever the visual state of my page changes, it will cascade that down to any contained controls. So if I've got a child user control that also needs to morph itself because we just went into snap view, it will cascade that down to that child control. Um, the other thing that it puts into these common classes, these all show up in your common folder in your Visual Studio project, as we'll see, is the suspension manager. And this is the one that's really uh, responsible for doing this automatic saving and retrieval of state when you suspend and resume from terminate. So there's basically a dictionary per page is the way it sets it up. It sets up one kind of root dictionary associated with the frame, and then each page gets its own dictionary of key value pairs it can write in there. So if you've got something like a horizontal scroll position and some text in each text box that the user has put in there and a selection in the list box, you're supposed to be writing those in. You come up with the individual keys for those. You could use the control ID or something like that. You're writing those into this dictionary or reading them out of the dictionary. Uh, and the dictionary is being managed by the suspension manager. Suspension manager takes care of that lifecycle aspect that says anytime I suspend, I'm going to persist everything that's in my di dictionaries because I'm going to assume the worst that, they might, that I might be terminated. And then when you launch, it's going to inspect a flag that comes in that those states that I showed on that state diagram are actually a flag that comes into your unlaunched method. So it's going to inspect that flag. It's really your code, as you'll see, that has to inspect it. But uh, there's code that will inspect that flag and decide to restore the state from the suspension manager. All right, so let's switch back here. I luckily didn't screen lock this time. Oh, wrong screen. OK, um, so let me walk through you know, a basic uh, sample of all the stuff I've been talking through. So I'm going to start here. We'll go to C Sharp, Windows Store category, and I'm going to start with a blank app. Now, in terms of templates, the grid app and split app are nice for getting used to the layout and some of the basic navigation. Um, but in terms of building up your own app, you got to go strip a bunch of stuff out. So you'll probably be tempted and want to start with the, uh, the blank app here. So we'll just call this SAML nav demo. Won't worry about the casing there. And if you start with a uh, blank app here, the common folder is going to be virtually empty. It just has the standard styles here, which I'll uh, mention. And you've got a main page. The app class derives from application. The page class derives directly, whoops, drives directly from page. Now, as a better starting point here, um, well, first off, in the app class, you have your initial navigation is already in there. If I scroll on down here, you can see here's our unlaunched handler that I was referring to in the slides. It gets in a launch activated events args that has a number of uh, relevant pieces of information for you. First is this activation kind. And you can see the important thing to realize is that there's a number of different ways your app can be launched in the Windows Store environment. Primary one is just launch. That means the user clicked on a, a live tile or something like that. But if you're familiar with the search charm that flies out from the right side of the screen, if you're registered for the search charm, your app cannot even be running. The user can select it in there. That causes an activation, and the search argument comes into your app. So that's a whole separate way of launching your app. Likewise, there's a sharing contract that you can be in some to totally separate app, like the email app, and go to create an appointment, for example. And it can use the sharing contract to launch your application if you're the calendar, uh, and it will pass in arguments. So that's a different way of starting. And you can see there's other things. There's things called protocols. These are things where you can have a custom app-to-app -app communication protocol and pass arguments. So there's things like that that can get your app 
uh, activated. So you might detect on that and do different things. We're not going to focus on that so much. But the one that is certainly relevant here is the one that is where those states in my state diagram came from, is this is that argument that comes in on launch that tells you what was the last running state of this application. So when you start in the not running, then that's a clean, fresh start from install or from restart of the machine. Uh, you can see the close by user there if they explicitly closed it. And then the one that you really need to react to is the terminated one, because that's the one where you're expected to restore all that state, put the app back in the state it was when they last saw it. So in the basic template here, or the blank app template, <clears throat> you can see they've got some boilerplate code down here that sets up a place to do that restoring of the state, but they don't really hook up anything to do it. And we'll see what the consequence of that is as we go on here. So in my main page here, um, I'm going to actually delete this thing off because this one just is completely blank when you use the, the blank template here. Um, a better starting page place for most of your pages, I'll just delete this off, and I'll add in a new item and use the basic page template. When you use basic page, it lays out at least the header, the standard header sizes, and a back button for you that will automatically enable and disable based on the state of the frame, as you'll see. So I always use basic pages as my starting point. I'll go ahead and call that main page again. And what is prompting me here is this is the point where it does that code gen of those classes like Layout Aware Page and Suspension Manager that I talked about. So I always want to say yes to that. And we can see it pops in several things here. Uh, bindable base is an important one to be aware of for any objects you're going to data bind to because it in, uh, basically encapsulates the iNotify property change implementation for you. And it gives you this helper method so your set blocks can just call set property and don't have to do the change detection and the firing of a property change event. The layout aware page that I talked about in the slides is defined here. It's got a whole bunch of stuff. I won't go through all the gory details here, um, but we'll see in the derived pages how we end up using that as we go through here. And then the suspension manager, the key thing to point out here is the way the suspension manager is doing its work is it's got a dictionary, as I said. Ultimately, it's just a fancy dictionary, but it's a self-persisting dictionary that down below, it's got this save stuff, and you can see uh, Data contract serializer. Uh, it's basically using the data contract serializer from WCF. It's not making service calls, but it's just using that as a serialization engine to take whatever objects you put into that dictionary and persist them out to disk when you shut down. And it's writing it to, you can see down below, it's using a storage file. So it's using the local storage mechanism, which is kind of like isolated storage, if you've been exposed to that in .NET. It's isolated to the individual application to keep every application sandboxed. It's just writing to the local storage for this application when it persists it out using the data contract serializer. And then you can see it's an async method following the new task-based async patterns. And the corresponding restore async is also task-based. So that sets up the infrastructure for doing all the stuff I'm talking about. So we've got our main page now derives from that. Um, and let me just bring it up here. Let's rebuild. Okay, so we've got our main page there. I'm just going to scroll down a little bit here and throw a button on the page so we can start causing some navigation. So I'll just pull a button out here and double click on it. And a couple things to point out here in the code behind before I go on is notice these load state and save state are put into the, the code behind of your derived class from layout aware page. So these become your kind of top level navigation methods, even though they're focused on loading and saving state. They're going to be called based on navigation as well as suspension. As I said, you really should be doing the same thing when you navigate away from a page as you do on suspension. So load state is going to be called when you're navigated to or when you're resuming from termination, really, I should say, not suspension. Remember, I said resuming from pure suspension, nothing happens. But resuming from termination, this will automatically be called by WinRT as it restores that page. You can see that you have a navigation parameter. So if you're coming there because of navigation, this is how you can pass some state in. And then you've got this dictionary, which is really passed down from the, the base class using a dictionary it got from that suspension manager. So the dictionary that's being passed in here, you can just read and write values from. And the suspension manager is going to take care of persisting that as your app starts up and shuts down. And then likewise, the save state is your 
persist on leaving, whether you're leaving for navigational purposes or leaving because you're being suspended. Okay, so down here, if we want to command navigation, what we would do is go to our frame property on our base class that I mentioned and just call navigate. Now, this wants you to pass a type of a page you're going to navigate to. So it's going to take care of creating a whole new instance and making that the current contents of the frame. So you get a full page lifecycle on each one of these by default. There is an ability to have a uh, um, cached page, it's called. So there's a flag you can set that makes it cache your pages. So even though you're going to say, I want to navigate to this type, it's actually going to hold on to other pages that you marked as cached when it navigates away from them. And it will just go look. It's got you know, effectively a dictionary of its own that is keeping track of what pages do I already have loaded, and it can reactivate that page. Most of the time, stay away from cache pages. Just let it do this full lifecycle stuff. But if you're really trying to optimize the load time, if you're finding performance problems, especially on the lower end devices like an RT, you know, if you've got a whole ton of bindings and things in there, there can be a noticeable lag as it loads up a complex page. So you might consider caching your pages at that point. It doesn't change the APIs you use, um, but just be aware that's an option for you. So here we would need another page to navigate to. So let me go ahead and add one. Do another basic page. Call it very imaginative page two. And let's just throw a text block on here that we can display something so we know we're there. And I'll take this text block. Let's change the text to I am page two. And I'll put a style on there from the standard styles is static resource header text style. So this is coming out of these um, common standard styles that were in there by default. There's a bunch of different uh, text block oriented styles in there you can look at, text box ones, button styles, and things. There's a whole ton of them that are commented out for app bars. So you know you see that a lot of these app bars have spiffy little icons for arrows and refresh you know, curly arrows and stuff like that. Don't go try to invent those yourself. They're already down there in the standard styles. You just have to go locate them. They're well named. You uncomment them, and you can start using them for your app bars. OK, so now we've got that. And we should be able to uh, go back to our code behind that we were writing and put in here that we want to navigate to type of page two. Fire that up. Not surprisingly, we can click on the button. We end up in page two. It's got the stack navigation going for us, so we can go back and so on. Now, there is one problem right now in terms of all the stuff I've been saying is that if I terminate, the, if I suspend this app right now and it gets terminated, which if you're not aware, you can control yourself for development and debugging purposes, I can switch back to Visual Studio. And when you're running in debug mode from Visual Studio, things are a little bit different, even though I have just taken that off the screen. Normally, that would equate to a suspension. It doesn't when you're in debug mode. So it's still running even though it's not on screen. It's the one caveat to what I said before. Um, but you've got this debug location toolbar up here. You can see I've got this checked here. And it has this little drop down where you can now command suspension. So you can go ahead and if you're debugging your suspension event handlers, you can go ahead and go set breakpoints and see what's going on and know exactly when suspension happens. And then you can resume and see, you know, first off, a resume from suspension, you won't see anything happen. But if you're trying to you know, make it pause and prove to yourself that your loop stops looping, for example, you can see that. And then you can resume and see that your loop starts going again. But the important one here is the one that's mislabeled and should just say terminate. Um, it's called suspend and shutdown. But really, this equate, equates to suspend and terminate is what it really means. Because as I showed in the graph, you always transition through suspension, whether you're fully shutting down from the user or you're going into suspension and potentially terminating. So this, if I terminate, remember we were on page two, but I restart my app, and we land back on our home page. So we're not actually retaining our state the way we should, because one of the most important things to retain is where was the user within your app and all the transient state associated with that page. So the thing that's missing here is even though the uh, blank template is a good place to start for building up your own application, unfortunately, to do the right thing in terms of saving all that state, it has to use the suspension manager. The suspension manager didn't exist when I created that basic template, or the blank template. It didn't come into being until I created the first blank page. 
So the app uh, code behind here, as I showed before, has stubbed out place to do the right thing for termination, but it couldn't put the code there because the class didn't exist yet. It's kind of a race condition in the code gen there. So a way to fix that quickly, if you do want to start with the blank template and not have to go strip out all the stuff the other templates put in there, is just go fire up another project. Pick either grid or split app template, which pre-populates those classes as it generates the project, and it puts the right code in the app code behind uh, to manage the lifecycle appropriately. So I can just copy the whole app class from here, bring it back over to my blank template, I'll just overwrite this one with the other one. And then I just got to patch up a couple things. One is it's got a different root page. So I want to change this back to be my main page. It's the first navigation. Um, and then it's got, you can see some red dots over here from the productivity power tools. You can see it's got dependencies on the suspension manager. So I just have to resolve that because it's down in the common namespace. So I just resolve that. All my red dots should go away. And what you can see here is there are several points of interaction here in the onLaunched. First off, it registers a frame. So this is where I said it kind of associates a dictionary per frame, but you typically only have one frame in your application anyway. And then inside of the terminated block, this is the important point, is that it restores, calls that async method to restore any state that was in the suspension manager only if you are coming back from terminated. If you come back from a normal shutdown by the user, or if you, you know, are launching for the first time, you shouldn't be restoring state there, even though there might be some there, because the suspension manager, you can see the other piece here is that we've got a suspending event handler, and when we suspend, it assumes the worst, and it saves all the transient state that was written into those dictionaries. So you know, if you start up with a closed by user, or even they restart the machine, and it's not running, there can be some safe state out there for your application, but you really shouldn't be loading it because you're not coming back from termination. So only in the terminated block will you call that restore async. And then it's got its own exception. You can do something, some logging for if it makes sense for you. Okay, so just by putting that you know, fix in there, now if we go ahead and launch, we navigate off to our other page, and we go back to the Visual Studio and terminate and then relaunch the app. We're back on page two, and notice it maintains the navigation stack for us. So all the, you know, the, the hard part of, or the important part of getting to the right page and maintaining the navigation stack that got you there, that's all automatic through that register frame thing. The frame takes care of that for you and the suspension manager. The only thing you're responsible for reading and writing into those dictionaries is all the other stuff going on in your screen, text boxes, list selections, those kind of things. Okay, now the other thing you can do with navigation APIs here is pass parameters. So you move from page to page, you might want to pass some context off to the page you're navigating to. So there's an overload of the navigate here that takes an object parameter. So we could start simple here and just say hello from main. And then on the receiving side, you've got a couple opportunities to deal with it. So in the code behind of the page two here, as I mentioned, it pregens these load state and save state methods. And so you can go ahead and go into the load state because you can see the navigation parameter comes in right here. So if all you need to do is have access to the uh, nav parameter, here we could go ahead, let me jump into my view and put a name on my text box so I can change it. So we can just see the effect there. Just give this thing a next name of db1. No, I don't name my controls like that. Um, and then we'll just set the text equal to our navigation parameter dot to string. Okay, and as you might expect, when we navigate now, we should see our state come in passed along from the view that we navigated from. Now, it's very tempting here, and I've done this myself, and I even talked about this in one of my Pluralsight courses as if it was a good thing to do and then realized later it wasn't. It's tempting to say, well, I might have a you know, real object that I want to pass there. So I'm going to go create a product class, let's say. And we'll just give this a couple of properties, maybe a prop int ID and a prop string name. 
So then over here in main page, perhaps we've got a list of products that we're gonna present, and then we have a selected product, and then we're gonna go to our product details. So a very natural thing to do here would be to go get that product from our list, for example. I'll just simulate that here by newing one up. And we'll say ID 42, of course, and name. Hmm, what's a product some people have on their minds this week? That would probably be it especially if you spent hours in line for one. Okay, so now we might say, well, of course it would be natural to just pass P here. It's an object parameter, why can't I pass that? And the fact is you can, and we could go to the code behind here, and we could change this and say product P equals nav parameter as product, if I can spell, and then if P not equal to null, we will set our text box text to the name of the product. And this will work just fine. So we can run it, click on the link, and there's our surface. The problem is when we do this. So I go back to Visual Studio, and I suspend and terminate again. And then we get boom, and we see com errors and H results, and we run screaming from the room. Um, basically what's happening here is the WinRT APIs, you've got a managed object up here with state in it, and you're asking the, uh, really what's happening is it has to do with that navigation parameter, is the WinRT APIs, the, the navigation stuff that happens under the covers, is trying to persist that navigation parameter for you, not through the suspension manager, which is a managed class and could have handled it if it knew about the types, but this is all happening down inside WinRT. So it can't quite deal with those managed objects. It doesn't know what to do with them. So it is a limitation of those parameters that to you know, be a robust app that doesn't crash on termination, um, you need to only pass primitives there. So strings, integers, guids, that kind of thing. Let the receiving page go look it up, get it out of a repository, something like that, um, or make a service call to get that state back, but don't try to pass whole objects here. I'm sorry? Yeah, it, ultimately it's doing, the, the question is, is the problem here serialization? Ultimately it's doing serialization down inside of WinRT, but it's doing it you know, through unmanaged APIs that don't know about these managed objects. Question back here. Every time you, well this, this comes in, so the question is, do you have to pay the cost of serializing, deserializing every time you navigate? And this comes down to the way you uh, architect your application. So if you've got page one and page two both work with product data, for example, the way I would architect that is I would have a product repository that sits somewhere behind them, uh, probably behind a view model because I usually do MVVM. And so you know, page one, yes, it would be presenting products and stuff, but it doesn't need to pass the product directly to page two. It just needs to pass an identifier to page two because page two can go and get it out of the repository as well. So I wouldn't be reading and writing those objects you know, every time I navigate like that. I would have the uh, data that is shared across multiple views somewhere behind the scenes. Now if that data itself is transient, then yes, you know, every time I change that data, I should be persisting it so that if I get suspended and terminated, that transient data is still there. But for something like products that I look up from a service call, you know, when the app launches fresh again, I can always just go repopulate my repository on launch and, you know, start dealing with that client-side data again as objects in memory. Does that make sense? So it's really just the transient state, the stuff that is, you know, only exists as properties on objects in memory on the client side that you would worry about saving out as you navigate from page to page. And a lot of that, you know, in reality, the way you would probably architect an app is if you're doing a full navigation away from a page, a lot of that you're probably going to more persist in a permanent way anyway by making a service call, putting it in a database or something, you know, because you're probably navigating because you hit save as opposed to just letting them freeform, you know, wander around from page to page in your application without saving anything. You're probably going to make them do some kind of commit stage as they leave a page in a lot of cases. So it's only that transient stuff that you let them maybe you know, switch to some other page to reference something and then switch back, but they haven't pressed save yet. Then all that stuff on that page you would need to be putting into those dictionaries. Okay, 
Uh, let me just check my script here, make sure I didn't think of miss anything else important there. No, that was basically what I wanted to show in that one. Okay, so there you can see the basic navigation. You've got a navigate call on the frame. You pass the type of the page that you want to navigate to. Optionally, you pass a parameter as well. That parameter needs to be a primitive that can be serialized properly so you don't end up with this error. Um, other things, uh, just real quick, that uh, you know, I didn't really highlight is in these pages, when you use the basic page template, you've got this back button up here. What it's really wired up to, if I kind of get to the XAML a little better here, you will have pre-populated up here this little header block as a grid. It's got the button is uh, the back button. It's using one of those standard styles, like I said, to present the error. And then it's got the is enabled bound to the frame property of the page base class. And there's a can go back method on that, a Boolean, that tells you, uh, you know, whether you can go back or not. And so it's kind of subtle here because this is just is enabled. You would expect it to gray out or something. But down inside those standard styles, um, this style actually makes it so the button disappears. It sets the visibility as well um, when the is enabled changes. So you don't have to worry about hiding and showing that. You saw that when we launched the application and we're on the home page, it's disabled because you can't go back, but it's also not even presented there. So it takes care of that for you. And the, uh, the actual action there of clicking on the button, um, you can see it's got a click pointing to a go back method. If you go into the code behind, there is no go back method, but it's actually down on your base class in the layout aware page has the go back uh, method hooked up. It calls frame go back for you. So that's where some of that stuff is happening. All right, let me switch back to my slides here and move on. Okay, so uh, I was going to do a quick demo. How many people want to see a quick demo of WinJS just so they can make those correlations? A few hands. Let me just show it real quick. I got enough time. So if you do the same thing, in this case, I'm just going to do a file new project with a grid app that has some navigation hooked up. So you would go to your other languages if you're set up for C Sharp, JavaScript, Windows Store apps, and I'll pick the grid app. Functionally, it's exactly the same as the grid app in the, the XAML C Sharp templates. Um, but now you're talking about HTML and JavaScript is the way you express things. But again, don't think of this as you're building a web app that you know kind of shows up on the start screen. This is a smart client rich application that you're just using HTML as an alternative to XAML for expressing your pages. And you're using JavaScript as an alternative to C Sharp for expressing your code behind for those pages. It is compiled, it is a native application, and it's calling directly into those same WinRT APIs, and WinRT is calling it directly as unmanaged code. And in fact, you can see some of that. If you look here, remember our arguments to launching in a, in a XAML app, we had an application or an activation kind enumeration that came in, and we had an application executed state flag that came in. That's exactly what these are. WinJS is just a wrapper, a JavaScript wrapper, around those unmanaged WinRT APIs to let you call into them and to let it call back to you. So we've got the you know, direct analogies here is that we have this activated handler in this default JS is the equivalent of your app XAML code behind. <coughs> it's sort of the start of life of your application. And it checks to see whether it's a launch activation and if it's terminated and it's got some more comments that this is where you would do your restoration of state uh, for your app. It's got session state is being maintained by the separate app object. Um, and you can see some navigate calls down here to do your initial navigation to your home page uh, when you first start up the application. When you're off on some other page, so let me just run it real quick so you can see here sure it's concrete here. It's the standard grid application template that you can go down to a section level in that hierarchical scheme, and you see items within that section, and then you can go down to a detail level, or directly from the home page, you can go to a detail level by clicking on one of those. So exactly the same functionally as the one that gets created in XAML. The differences are really mostly syntactical, because you've got navigate calls on a nav object. It's kind of like your frame object. Uh, that nav object is this navigator class I mentioned in the slides that really defines a JavaScript object called page control navigator that wraps up all the navigation APIs for you, declares what your home page is, and when you navigate to blank, it basically goes to whatever the, uh, 
the root pages in the application. And you can see it's got some key press handling, it's got a navigated function and so on. Um, when you go to the individual pages over here, we go into a grouped items page. We've got our markup that defines the page. And it includes things like a button with an on-click, navigate to group. So these are the buttons that are really the uh, little chevrons and stuff for the group summaries that will navigate down to a group based on a group key. <coughs> and then in the receiving page, in its JavaScript, you can see there's a ready function that's part of this define uh, function up here. You pass in an, uh, an object that has a ready handler in it. It gets passed in an options object, and in that options object, it's got the group key that was passed. So you gotta, you know, if you're not comfortable with JavaScript syntax and these curly braces to define objects and functions as objects and so on, it's very easy to get lost in this stuff. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry about that. Blow out your ears there. <clears throat> but those are all the analogies. You've got navigate methods. <clears throat> you've got arguments to those navigate methods. And you've got handlers on the receiving side that can take those in and change things about the page that's being loaded up. All right, so let me shut that down. <clears throat> Switch back over here. And let's talk a little bit about how is this different if you're going to do MVVM. So in MVVM, model view, view model, um, the presumption is your view is your page. Uh, and generally, if you're doing MVVM in Windows Store applications, most of your views are going to be pages. Now, you certainly can go composite and have subsections of the page be user controls that are views with their own individual view models. You generally won't go more than one level deep with that, or you're probably getting carried away uh, with complexity. Because Windows Store apps, part of the design guidelines is that you know an individual page should be focused on doing one thing. It shouldn't be like a traditional line of business app that has 400 controls on the screen and you know a tab control with a tab control inside of that with a scrolling region of 16 grids inside of that. If you're doing that stuff in a Windows Store app, you're doing it wrong. You really should be partitioning all that stuff and saying there's individual tasks that a user is going to do with my app, and I move them from page to page to accomplish that task putting smaller amounts of information in their face at one time. Um, but with MVVM, you'll have your page, you'll have your view model. You may have some services that sit behind it. Uh, one of the ideas is that a view model shouldn't necessarily be coupled to exactly how it does persistence. So you could make direct service calls from a view model, for example. But what happens if you change your mind tomorrow and you change those from being, let's say, a WCF service call to being a web API call or maybe an OData call? And then you find out, well, but I also want to do some caching on the client side. So I'm going to, sometimes I'm going to read and write from a local store, but sometimes I'm going to make a service call. Should all that stuff be going in your view model? No, not really. View model just says, give me data, and here's updated data. And so you factor out those responsibilities to something like a repository as a separate design pattern of this is the thing that knows how to do persistence and encapsulates the details of that and just lets you say, give me data, and, and here's updated data. So the view model may depend on these other services. But what's important here is that in the MVVM pattern, I may even have animation callouts here, yes. So in the MVVM pattern, where does navigation happen? Where is the logic that decides it's time to navigate and where should I navigate to? It really should be down in your view model methods, typically in command handlers. The buttons will bind to commands on your view model. The view command handlers will be logic down inside of your view model. Likewise. Um, when you navigate to a page and you need to initialize the state that's going to be presented on that page, where does that state exist? Its properties on a view model. So the code that really needs to be activated when navigation happens is not on lo or the load state and save state in the page behind code behind I was showing. It's handlers that you would wire up in your view model that says, ooh, my corresponding view has been activated. I better populate the data that it's binding to. And then the other thing would be that <clears throat> No, well, it kind of overlaps with what I just said. It's just all the state management. As I navigate away, I need to persist my state. The code that uh, does that needs to be down in the view model. So the view model kind of becomes the center of the universe of where all this code related to navigation and state management should reside. The problem is you saw that in the, you know, the code I've been showing so far, the access to all that stuff is coming out of the page class and out of the frame class, which are UI elements. They're part of the. They're actually unmanaged UI elements coming out of the WinRT APIs, 
<clears throat> and in the MVVM pattern, it's all about decoupling. And one of the motivations in MVVM is to keep that logic code in your view model unit testable. Can't unit test code that touches WinRT APIs in any sensible way because it expects that there is a UI rendered on the screen that it's, that it's talking to. So taking direct dependencies on the frame object, for example, in your view model would kind of violate the MVVM pattern. So you need a way to abstract all that out. <clears throat> for those that attended my talk yesterday, you saw that you know, one way to go about that, it's already been done for you. Uh, the Microsoft Patterns and Practices group that I worked with in developing this is, has developed something called Prism for Windows Runtime. And if you've been exposed to Prism in WPF and Silverlight up through Prism version 4.5 is the most recent release with .NET 4.5. Um, Prism for WPF and Silverlight was a little bit different focus. It was all about building maintainable, extensible, testable applications in WPF and Silverlight. This is too if you minus off the extensibility because in a Windows Store app, you have to package your app as a signed uh, AppX package. You can't really dynamically extend that at runtime the way you can a WPF or Silverlight app. So this still has the maintainable, testable goals uh, that the previous version of Prism did applied to Windows Store apps. But in addition, what we really tried to focus on is showing you, you know, how do you have good separation of concerns, good maintainability and stuff, while still fully leveraging all of the capabilities and features that WinRT has to offer. So it you know, really focuses on things like navigation, state management, working with the search charm, settings charm, and things like that, but doing it all in the context of applying the MVVM pattern as a means to being maintainable. So you can basically pull this down. Um, it's got a, a full sample app called the Adventure Workshopper that you see on screen there. The place to go for this is Prism Windows Runtime codeplex.com is the root address for it. You get full source code, it's all open source. You can take it, party on, change it, redistribute it. Uh, you just can't contribute back to the source code direct base directly. And uh, basically what Prism has in it <clears throat> is for the navigation side of things, it's got a wrapper around the frame so that your view model can be in charge of navigation, participate in it, just not be directly coupled to the WinRT object that's making it all happen. So it just puts a thin wrapper around the frame class called Frame Navigation Service. Uh, it puts an interface boundary on that so that you can have decoupling and mockability for unit testing in your view models that take a dependency on that. So you can inject that. Basically, the application base class that you'll use with Prism sets up that, that Frame Navigation Service, wraps the root frame, has a corresponding thing like the suspension manager called the session state service that does all the reading and writing of the state and makes it so that you can just inject a reference to the singleton service down into your view models and then interact with it. And I'll show this in code here in a moment. Um, likewise, the view model base class that you'll use for your view models has a interface called iNavigation Aware. It will be called by that frame navigation service as you navigate to and navigate from the corresponding page. So what it's really doing under the covers is the frame navigation service looks at the frame and says, okay, you're, you're about to navigate away. Uh, what, is the course, the, what is the current content that's in you? That will be the page. It looks at the page and says, what is your data context? Because when you're doing MVVM, the basic equation of MVVM is view.dataContext equals view model. So your data context of your view should be, be set to an instance of your view model. So basically the frame navigation service leverages that and says, oh, I can look at the current page I can try casting its uh, data context to the view model base class of Prism. And, uh, really, it casts it to iNavigation Aware here, the interface, that, uh, so that other types could implement that as well. And if it is that type, then it can call this interface has navigated to and navigated from methods on it. So it makes it so that it can be made aware in the same way that the page has those load and save state methods. And by the way, I meant to show it in the demo, but just to, for completeness here. If you go look at uh, layout aware page, if you're not doing MVVM, layout aware page does have navigated to and navigated from overridable methods on it. And there's a little bit more information available to you on those than there is in the load and save state. The load state you saw, you only had the navigation parameter available to you. If you override the on navigated to, you also have a, a separate flag that tells you, is it a new navigation? Meaning, you know, someone directly navigated there from a command of navigate or is it a back navigation, a forward navigation, or a refresh navigation? 
And that refresh flag can be handy because you only get a refresh navigation if you're coming out of that terminated state. If it's navigating to your view because it's restoring that as the current view from uh, launching from termination, it'll have that flag. So be aware that's another you know, tidbit of information that's available for managing all this stuff if you're doing it from the page code behind. Our navigated to and navigated from in the PRISM framework uh, have those, the, all those parameters available to you. <coughs> so if your view model implements this interface or you just inherit from our view model base class, which already does, you can override these methods on your view model and be made aware of the navigation parameter, what kind of navigation it is, and you also have access to those same dictionaries if you want to write, read and write raw key value pairs into the dictionaries. Um, but it also has some uh, state management. So on a view model, there's an attribute you can put on your properties called restorable state, and it will automatically read and write those uh, things. Oh, I'm already over time. All right, so let me just uh, summarize here. So basically, it's got some stuff down there. You can go uh, look at some resources. Go to tinyurl.com slash prismrt series is an article series I've written on this, and I've got a whole article dedicated to what I'm covering in this slide. And uh, tinyurl.com prismrt course, and you can get to my Pluralsight course. I've got a six-hour course on Prism for Windows runtime. So just uh, be aware this stuff is there. Uh, if you go pull down the code, there's several samples with the Prism RT stuff, and you can go look at those, and they've got navigate calls, and they've got stuff down in the view models that manages all this. Apologize for not having enough time to show all that stuff. So thanks for your attention. Please do fill out your evals, and enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>